to find it Take my hand or take a stand And I would never mind it Food access and food security have always been critical issues in this neighborhood. We're up against all odds. There's a lot of blight, lots of conditions that really don't foster hope in people. There's a lot of kids who we encounter who actually don't, haven't seen certain fruits or vegetables they've never seen, you know, asparagus. 20% of people in this neighborhood don't have cars, you know, so folks would often buy their groceries at the local liquor store. This used to be an old liquor store, so by changing into something new, we were able to kind of change what people look and how people look at food. And through that kitchen, we were able to launch several new businesses, and we thought, well, why stop there? Today, we are in the Allen Marketplace, a multifunctional food resource center and food hub. Visitors, they're not all Dearborners, and we get a lot from Chicago, from Toledo who come to Dearborn just to you know, stock up on halal meat. We had some vacant lots and I said I would love, I would love to have a garden. We also look at mid-Michigan as a great place to grow food. The program that we have, the Lansing Roots program, as a farm incubator, we're trying to reach out to those who uh, historically don't have a place in the in the American agriculture system. On our 10 acre site right now we have 11 different farmers who are actively farming. Seven of those farmers are refugee families. Um, we also work um, with low-income individuals, individuals with disability, people of color, and women. <laughs> So Devi and Harka and Bima, this is their second year in the program. They're part of a, a large Bhutanese and Nepalese community here in Lansing. Harka is using one of our uh, one of our mowers to help to control the weeds around his his plants you can see the areas where he's already done uh, there are many different methods of weed control mowing is one of them when you have a very large space you have to maximize your time be as efficient as possible and if you if the weeds start to get ahead of you as they have right here one of the things you can do is just come in and mow them down so that's um, Again, we try to show our farmers all of the different options for growing, for managing weeds, pests, all of the different things that, that you encounter on a farm. One of the things that we like to provide uh, for everyone here is the best possible opportunity to be successful, also to show them things that they might do in the future if they have their own farm. What this structure allows is for us to grow food about eight months of the year in Michigan as opposed to about five months of the year. These are Muhammad's tomatoes. It's going to be a great example for the other farmers. When they see later this week and next week how Muhammad's tomato plants look, the ripening tomatoes, and then they can go out to their own field and they can see the tomato plants that they planted a full month after Muhammad planted these and they will have a very good idea of how useful uh, this structure is. So we have a, uh, an AmeriCorps member who operates this space as a demonstration garden and he can also show our farmers different techniques for growing. This right here is one of my very favorites. Um, this is called a three sisters garden. This is a, 
um, a way of interplanting that Native Americans have been practicing for over 4,000 years. And the farmers can come here and they can see what Pete has done and then they can use that as a model for what they do in their own space. I'm here to learn how to do it, how to do it, how to do it, how to do it. One of the things that is important um, to have a successful farm is to have proper refrigeration for your uh, crops once they're harvested. So we took uh, what was just a regular box truck, a delivery vehicle that was no longer in service for our organization, and we repurposed it. We built a walk-in cooler inside of it. We have a window air conditioner that uses a unit called a cool bot to make the air conditioner run more cold so we can actually keep this at 40 degrees just like a regular walk-in cooler in a restaurant or a grocery store would be. Every day it's uh, something different. Some days it's weeding the cabbage and the cauliflower. Some days it might be harvesting the zucchini or the turnips. There is an almost endless amount of work to do. Um, some days I get lucky and Debbie is so generous, thank you so much, and will give me mustard greens that she has grown in her own personal space so that I can also take home good healthy food to, to, um, to be able to eat well, so thank you. Thank you. Right now we have six employees total and we plan on quadrupling that number at full production. And that's still a drop in the hat for employment. Um, you know, there's hundreds of hundreds of people looking for jobs in our neighborhood who are underemployed and unemployed without the right skill set. As a demographic, we're dealing with, you know, about 70% government assistance benefits, third grade reading education on, on average, um, and 30% vacancy. We're up against all odds. So this is a community development based business. So you have to live in our target zip codes to work here. And what we're really doing is trying to improve work skills and trade relations as the green industry is building in the city. And this is the first licensed aquaponics farm in the city of Detroit. How it all works is that we have a sprinkler system. And this is nutrient rich fish water that has been processed and filtered and it pumps upstairs. We emit it through the sprinklers for our aeroponic system. It oxygenates the roots, and so we get explosive growth, as you see here, to the point where eventually they'll dip down into the reservoir and pick up the excess silt left behind from the fish waste. All the plants you see here, we start them by seed back here in our germination area. At about a month and a half, the plants are large enough to implant through the system, which is what James is working on back here. Um, behind you on this side is our microgreen production area. So we're doing things like sunflower shoots, pea shoots, wheat grass, uh, bean sprouts, very lucrative crop that is actually much higher in antioxidants and essential oils than the actual full-grown adult, full adult crop, and it's fast. So microgreens are used mostly for salads, soup sandwiches, stir fries, things like that. So when you think about traditional tilapia stock, it's coming from China and it's coming from Latin America. They're also heavily pumped with antibiotics and hormones just to keep them alive long enough to get to America where we can buy 10 fillets for three to four bucks. Once females start breeding and producing eggs, they don't really grow and so they lose their production value weight. So when they're babies, actually the, the main procedure is to introduce sex reversing hormones that will turn females into males. Here, we do not, <laughs> we do not do that. So again, no antibiotics, no hormones, no steroids. None of that happens with the fish. We use organic non-GMO food for the fish, and that's all they receive. This is our breeder set right here. By finding this breeder from Florida, we are able to produce about 98% male offspring. There's about 1,000 fish in this tank, another 1,600 in the tank behind you, another about 2,000 fish in that side of the system as young babies. This piping is bringing down the filtered fresh water that the plants clean 
and it dumps it back into the fish tank. So all of our excess wastewater, as well as fish food, pours into this worm bed here. So just like your vermicompost garden out in your backyard, we are doing red wiggler production in this space. Now it looks kind of odd because it's in rocks, but as long as we provide moisture and nutrients, the worms will keep reproducing. Breakdown happens, it passes through the worm bed here and into our bowel filter on the back side there. So this is basically a large surface area space for bacteria to grow and to help with the conversion of ammonia to nitrates. So the whole system is ran by the single pump. All of the water within the system recirculates. So our only losses are evaporation and transpiration from the plants. We're going to be open 18 hours a day because you have to feed the fish every few hours. So by providing niche value agricultural skill set jobs, we're really putting our residents ahead of the game when it comes to building new business, building new industry in the city, and also learning about local food production. Yeah, through all of these bits and pieces, that's what we're trying to do, trying to create and reform community. We're cooking in flour omelet with peppers and onions and broccoli. I got to crack a few eggs and I stir it with a whisk. And we have three groups, the omelet part and the vegetable and the leaves. This is our um, summer garden camp program. It's a summer nutrition education program that we have at each of our partner schools in Lansing. It's a two week program and we actually hold the camp at the school so the kids have an opportunity to come back to their school and actually see the garden in action. I get to garden and write in our botany journals and I still get to cook a little bit. Uh, we get to do some activities, get to make recipes. I'll try one, I've never tried it. <laughs> The kids love it. They absolutely love it. A lot of the kids in this program also do our after school program during the year. So we actually visit every classroom in all of the schools. So we see uh, over a thousand kids every year. This particular area of Lansing is actually considered a food desert. There, there are no full service grocery stores in this area. So why our program started with Northwest Initiative is to sort of address that. You would be surprised how many kids have actually never even touched or been around certain fruits or vegetables. So they have, I mean, they have no context on how to cook or prepare them. We focus on uh, nutrition and learning how to plant and harvest and take care of the food that they're growing in the garden. And then we actually harvest the food and let them prepare a variety of healthy, nutritious um, recipes for them to taste. Once it's all cooked, which means all that runniness on all that stuff that's raw, that needs to be solid like this edge is. My favorite vegetable, probably tomatoes because they're in a lot of my favorite foods, but I don't like to eat them just bare. Mm. I'd say cabbage. This garden was actually our first garden. It's sort of our flagship garden. It was built in 2005, and then the next year after that, the hoop house was put up, so 2006. And this is mainly, you know, the hoop house is really mainly about season extension, so when we go back into the classroom in September, we will have bring the kids out and have them plant some fall crops, like we can plant um, spinach and kale and collard greens and things that will really just grow through the winter in here. Maybe not quite through the entire winter, but not in Michigan. And this is this is actually asparagus, so that's kind of a cool one to show the guy. I find a lot of kids have never seen asparagus growing before. The kids will be excited because they were asking if we could use tomatoes. We're making pizza on our last day. We have a pizza party, and they were asking if we could put tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, on the pizza. And we were saying, well, I don't know if they're gonna be ready by then, but.
we at the museum decided to kind of try to bring in different waves of uh, locals from neighboring cities, Metro Detroit, further out, Ann Arbor, uh, to come and just explore and see what Dearborn has to offer. And so each of the six locations that we chose highlight food culture in the Arab American and in the Arab world. All right, so we're going to make our way down to Laban, which is a Lebanese sweet shop. Now, I like to consider it more of a breakfast shop just because traditionally the kanafa, which is a, um, a cheese pastry uh, soaked in syrup, is traditionally served as a breakfast food. What we do know is that in the Dearborn area, about 60% are Arab American. Really what brought them here was the Ford factor. And so Ford then began to bring waves of Arabs from Lebanon. So the vast majority of store owners on Warren Avenue and in Dearborn tend to be Lebanese Americans. We are third generation. My grandfather started this business here in uh, 1959 in uh, Lebanon in a southern village. We specialize in roasting coffee. This is a blend of five beans from around the world. Well, I would blend this for you. See, this is basically a, like a prescription. And uh, let's say you like a bolder coffee. So I would give you maybe a three quarter dark and a quarter light. This uh, tea is for uh, after a woman gives birth. It kind of helps her body come back into homeostasis. It contains anise and star anise, which helps soothe the stomach. The cinnamon is good for the blood sugar control. Fenugreek is great for breast milk production. And the black caraway is for immune system. All these spices here are blended by us. These are our old world recipes. Like this is what you would get I mean, back yeah. in our village. So our next stop, which is the kitchen warehouse, highlights the importance of food, culture, hospitality, family, and Arab households. Pretty average to find this in a family of five households. Because there's some dishes that have to be cooked in such huge quantities. So this is usually for tea, okay? Um, and usually there's a handle. And for coffee, they typically use cups like this. Much smaller, you don't have to have handles, but very, very small. You don't really indulge in, in Turkish coffee using traditional coffee mugs. It's gonna be too much. When we look at Arab Americans in general, about 60 to 70% are Christian. It's a minority of Muslims that are Arab in, this, in the U.S. And the vast majority of Muslims, only 30% are Arab. The largest are in Asia, Indonesia being the largest. So those are always misconceptions that tend to go unnoticed or even stated in the media. Right there, that's a scarf shop. And you can see that there's different designs. A lot of people, tend to associate you know Islam with head wrapping mm -hmm. which makes sense uh, but they don't really add anything to it they just think it's just this cloth on your head when really there's a huge movement of fashionistas in the Muslim world and here in the US who are trying to come up with innovative ways of wearing uh, modest clothing so Shatilla is a very very popular destination in Dearborn the family, the grandfather, came to the U.S. in 1977 and in 1979 established a very small store on Warren. Um, it was so popular, people were standing outside the building. He then moved to south of Warren, uh, south of Schaefer, and had another store there, also very small, very popular. And in 2004, he moved to this location. Now, what's special about Shatilla is that during the time period, people would sell baklava by the pound. And he was the first to sort of sell it on a tray and ship it. So that sort of revolutionized, I guess you can say, the uh, uh, capitalization on Arabic sweets. In the early 1980s, there were like there were less than 10 Arab-owned businesses, and by 1900, by 1990, there were 50, and by 2000, there were 100, and today there are over 200 stores wow. that are Arab-owned. So you can see sort of the uh, evolution of store ownership ah. on Warren Avenue, not in Dearborn, but Warren Avenue. Warren. For years, literally for 10 years, 
neighbors who had grown to depend on our little farmer's market as a walkable weekly grocery store would see it go away um, with the advent of cold weather. And so for the first time last year, we uh, brought our market indoors into this space. And this is the marketplace itself. Uh, we're a 7,000 square foot facility here on the east side of Lansing. We're a food innovation district in and of ourselves. Uh, we have a commercial kitchen inside that we'll get to see, a uh, year-round farmer's market, uh, the exchange, which is my program that connects about 60 different farmers from around the area with institutions and restaurants all over the metro Lansing area. Today, we are are in the Allen Marketplace, a multifunctional food resource center and food hub. For the past 20 years, it's been completely vacant. It was originally the neighborhood grocery store. In the 20s and 30s, this was the place where everyone in this neighborhood came to get produce and all of their food. So we were thrilled when we uh, discovered that and realized that we were not only repurposing this old space, to community use, but to its original food-related use. We've got our kitchen right in here. And in here we have a, a 600 square foot facility that's available to rent for businesses, neighbors, those who are looking to start a food business continue a catering business. Uh, we have a restaurant that just moved in. Uh, we like to consider ourselves a bit of an incubator for small businesses. Uh, Red's is a great example of that, but another one that Joan may have mentioned to you is Sleepwalker Spirits and Ale. And Sleepwalker is a um, startup of East Side neighbors here who have been home brewing for about 20 years. and they've decided that they're gonna scale up and they're gonna start uh, their first business. Tonight we're teaching a class uh, just after this about basic culinary skills and we're gonna have everybody baking and making their own sourdough starters. Well, one of the things that we discovered early on is that there's a lot of hunger on Lansing's east side. We have a 25% poverty rate. Half of all families with children are headed by a single parent, often strapped, uh, often on assistance. One of the things that we found when we started the farmer's market 10 years ago was that we needed a place where folks would be able to use credit or debit cards or EBT machine um, to get you know, use their bridge cards to get food at the market and we weren't sure what we were going to do when we moved inside so this space was built out and we're able to function as a bank during the Wednesday market. We're also able to function as a place to serve drinks out of during events, uh, provide some information the rest of the time and really has been an ingenious little room. And we're going to have a cafe up here so that Folks can get coffee and um, food during the winter market and look out over the market. We were amazed at how the community really embraced this project. And we just paid attention to what people in the neighborhood were telling us about what they wanted to see more of. We feel that we are sowing seeds and we're giving back to the city of Detroit, something that was taken away in the 60s. And that was a strong relationship between the African-American community and the Jews. What we started off doing first was having what you call a building bridge over dinner. And what we would do is the Jewish community would come into this community, the black neighborhood, into the black homes and sit down and we will break bread together. And we will write questions and the questions will be like, where is your grandmother's mother's from? What do you like about your community? What do you not like about your community? And what is your favorite foods? And then the next meet a month, we will have it down at the synagogue. By the end of the building, the bridge over dinner, all the walls that came down, the stereotypes on both side, heck, sides of the fence that came down. And that's how we started building this bridge over dinner so we could have a um, garden. Original grant to kick off this garden was from the Jewish Woman Foundation. 
and I can't thank them enough. For two years in a row, they gave us money to support the garden. So that's how I got started financially. If you go over there, you see fresh squash. We have collard greens, we have spinach, we have beets, sugar snap peas that the kids eat straight off the bush. In this community, and a lot of communities around Detroit, we don't have cars. Whole Foods is like 10 point miles away from here. So there's no healthy choices here. This is a way that you'll know what healthy food is and what it tastes like without chemicals because the first day um, Golden fixed the bush beans, her kids said, what is this? Because they were used to eating and they're about to can and they taste so totally different. Bush beans right here, all through here we got green beans growing up. And this is a way of fighting di diabetes, obesity, and high blood pressure. So the difference in having a garden here between these buildings is it makes a difference of taking a bill off the table. Teaching them how, if you have a garden in your community or a garden in your backyard, you take a bill off the table and you teach your family how to eat healthy. That structure there is our future rain catchment because we, uh, we had originally wanted this house next door to purchase it for water, but it was set up a fire. The rain catchment is coming from different grants. Freshwater Future is one of them. And we're gonna build that so we don't have to tote water from my house all the way up the street to plant um, the water the garden. These buildings are going to get torn out or maybe rehab. This one might end up being rehab. So this, this structure doesn't mean anything because we're taking bad vacant lots and beautifying them and making them of use. We cook together, they come down and work in the garden, and the kids from both communities come together. So it is from the smallest to the tallest that we're learning how to get along and be as one. So it's, it was a wonderful process. We are a Jewish community and a black community that came together, and we're showing not only Detroit, that, but the world, that we, one community can make a difference. One community, one Detroit. So we can help to empower people to be able to learn and grow real skills here that they will take in whatever venture uh, they do in life. And that's what's very important is teaching. Teaching is the teaching episode and um, learning how to be healthy. Peaches and Greens, our produce market, just recently received a commercial kitchen add-on. So through that now we're able to do nutrition education and cooking classes which are a big part of what's missing in healthy eating habits across the country because you can grow all sorts of food but are you really feeding people and without people having the education or know-how of what to do with food how to preserve it how to plan and extend meals and what really is healthy and economical it's all you know it can very easily be for not the way they, the way they taught us. we've definitely found like the more you involve the kids the more they work in the garden and if they help to cook the food they're going to be way more likely to try it and they and it is so easy to bring people together around food my favorite part is probably um that we get to play games because the camp I did earlier this summer was really boring. <laughs> so this camp's not boring now? Yeah, no. Okay, good. <laughs> they hear us coming. Like any good farm, we have a large rock pile. <laughs> That's Jack's desk. Jack is the volunteer and events coordinator for the farmer's market and then we won't look at the messy desk over there, but that one's mine. <laughs> Can we buy something she's asking? Yeah, absolutely. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Spent all this time selling you and you're not going to buy something? Of course you can buy something. I'll be back.